This is Road to the Golden Door, where we unpack the proven success formula straight from the minds of Golden Door winners, uncovering the motivation, methods, and the mindset it takes to become an elite performer in door-to-door -door sales and in life. This is Road to the Golden Door. Now, here's your host, Mikey Lucas. What up? Welcome back. Road to the Golden Door. Got another special guest for you guys today. Looking forward to it. Another, uh, another multi-year Golden Door Award winner. Something special about this man that you guys are going to want to pay attention to here is he doesn't just have multi-Golden Door Award, multiple Golden Door Awards. He's also trained uh, probably now over close to 30 Golden Door Award winners uh, in total. Um, this year he had 13 guys, maybe women too, we'll find out, uh, 13 this year Golden Door Award winners in his organization. Parker Anderton from the Grit Marketing, he's a senior partner, he's got his partner, Skylar Griffin, um, two-time Golden Door Award winner. Brother, you've been in door-to-door -door sales for almost a decade. Uh, you've sold a lot of stuff, a lot of bug juice. Is it only been in door-to-door -door in, in, uh, in, uh, in pest control? That's all I've ever known. Let's go, dude. Bro, welcome to the show, man. Glad to have you. Glad to be here. All right, dude. So I uh, I know that a lot of the listeners, um, they see what pest control guys do. Um, obviously, you know, people that know me, I, I did, I did door, I started in alarm systems and transferred right that summer, next that right after that summer, post summer, into solar. I technically did both. I was in a uh, you know alarms and uh, and and solar at the same time, um, but you know, got obviously full time into solar. I've always said that people that are, if, if pest control was year round, you'd make like double or triple the amount of money that solar guys make because your guys is your work ethic. You just work. Um, and I'm excited to see because the grit obviously does something different uh, where you guys have almost 50 now golden door award winners this year. The year's not over yet. Um, you guys almost have 50 from what I understand from John Taylor. Um, so I'm excited because you, you, you're not, um, necessarily knocking full time anymore. You're now building teams and building and developing guys. So that is something that I think is the most under, uh, under talked about, under utilized and under, I would say developed, I guess you can say, um, um, character trait within somebody. And I need to learn how to do that better myself as well. Um, I would say that the guys that were under me, I've created multiple golden door winners myself, but I, and, and I've got a great following. People love me, but I know that I still don't have all of it. I would, I kind of say I'm a great leader, but I'm a terrible manager. So I'm excited to see um, really Parker uh, more into what the secret is at the grit and what you're doing differently. So for everyone that doesn't know Parker Anderton, who is Parker Anderton? Yeah. So I'm 29, uh, married. I have a two year old daughter. So I'm a father. Uh, I think I'm a friend. I really like uh, extreme sports, so dirt biking, um, wakeboarding. I'm, I, my family and my wife, my daughter, that's our favorite activity together is boating. It's actually what got nice. me into the door-to-door -door industry, funny enough, huh? um, and how I met my wife. But yeah, the dirt biking, like I said, skiing, snowboarding, skateboarding, love all that kind of stuff. Uh, like you said, I'm a senior partner at The Grit. Um, my, I guess my specialty, what I feel like I'm uh, where my niche is in The Grit is training. Um, and then managing. Uh, I love people. I love working with people. And I never, like most people in the industry, uh, started this not to be a career. Um, but I'm way grateful that it has turned into a career for me. Yeah, there's, um, let's talk about that for a second. Why, why do you think initially, like what was, what change, what breakthrough did you have? Um, because what, what, what about, was it the culture that you were in? I know you're from Orem, or at least you live in Orem now. Was it the culture that was like, hey, door to door, is that how you grew up? Is that what's your parents' thing? Like door to door is not a career. Like what is that? Because I know that now yeah. it sounds like it is. Yeah, so I'm from Salt Lake and I do think a lot of it is the culture. It's kind of like, you know, if you don't go to college and, and finish a degree, like you're not going to ever amount to anything. I don't know that anyone actually said that, but that was the feeling that I got. 
Um, and where I struggled uh, was in college, you know, I felt like I just wasn't ever excited about the classes I was in. Um, I'm a slow learner. It's not that I'm you know, dumb, I'm smart, but I'm a slow learner. And, and it was tough because a lot of the things I was learning, there are these general ed classes that aren't applicable to things that I was doing or excited about. And so I guess the reason I, I said it at first is, you know, I started it because I was a super poor college student. And I had a roommate who seemed to have money and went to college. And I thought, oh, this will help me get through college. Um, and as I began doing it, obviously, I realized that the money was great. Um, but again, it kind of had this like looming feeling like, dude, like you don't want to tell people you're a door to door salesman, like being a door to door salesman. That's not a career, right? You got to be a lawyer or, you know, in something. And so I continued to pursue school. It was actually in my senior year of college. I never finished. Um, that I just realized like, look, you know, what is a career, right? A career is something that, you know, you develop skills and you make money to pr provide for your family. And I found that in door to door sales, it was about my third or fourth year. I really liked it. Didn't hate it. Like I loved being out with people. I loved writing my own paycheck. I loved being able to like knock off a lot of the dreams on my vision board faster than I ever thought I would have been able to. And then I just realized like, who cares what society thinks? Like, I'm going to do what makes me happy. And I'm going to do what I think is going to get me and my future family to my goals and our dreams the fastest. And, you know, I think that uh, there was stigmas about it, right? Even like my own family probably at times was thinking like, okay, this kid's not finishing college. He's pursuing a career in door to door. I think, you know, now in retrospect, people would look at it and be like, wow, I'm way grateful he took that, you know, risk or that opportunity. But uh yeah, I think a lot of people feel like that. Um, I think there's a lot of social pressure and pressure from parents because that was how our parents were raised, right? Is if you don't go to college, you're, you know, not going to have a good job. But again, I think that uh, a big breakthrough for me was realizing like, just because it's summer sales doesn't mean it's not a real job. If anything, I think this is as real of a job as they come. I mean, we have real people, real income, real struggles. So, so why is it that it's not a real job? So. Yeah. Real clients, real like fires that are getting put, you know, real money coming in and out. Like we actually run the economy, you know, we are yeah. big contributors to the economy. Yeah. That's and real stresses, right? Like, that, you know, I see the stresses that my friends go through in, in their, you know, academic like endeavors. And I feel like I stress similarly just about different things. So. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's camp there for a little bit. Um, Let's talk about like, as you could, I guess you could say like the entrepreneur life versus the W2 life. What do you think the big differences are there? Like, like I want you, I would like you to, if possible, in theory, to compare yourself to maybe some of the guys that were in high school with you that are different from where you're at now and just kind of give a, give an insight to, again, I know I can tell that you have a good heart. So I, I know you're not going to like talk trash on them, but like in a sense of what they go through versus what you go through and the, and you obviously went a different route than them. So just kind of talk about that a little bit if you can. Yeah. Um, I've always felt, and I observed this as a young kid, um, whether it was with my own parents at times or friends' parents, dude, money is a, is a, is a huge issue throughout families, right? Whether it's not being able to afford something, not being able to afford yep. college or an event. And, and I remember as a really little kid feeling like I don't want that, right? And so to answer your question, um, what I see with friends is that money is a huge limiting factor, right? I would love to go on this dream Preach. vacation but uh, I would love to start this business, but, oh, dude, I have this idea, but, and I feel like, um, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it is a reality as I hang out with friends that it's, that money is a huge limiting factor, a huge stressing factor. Um, it's a, a cause of contention, right? Cause I mean, nothing's worse in a marriage than when you want to do something, but you can't afford it. And then knowing, especially in hourly jobs, it takes a long time to save, especially with all the expenses that we have as we get older. What I've found um, with this job is that it's almost like writing, it's almost like printing money. Um, if I want extra money, I can literally fly out to Dallas tomorrow and go sell for a week, right? Um, and so I see it as a huge opportunity where I found that money is, is no longer scarce, it's in abundance. Um, and that's been a really big blessing for me. That, you know, there has been times in, in, in my marriage where we can't afford something. And then we're able to go out and say, well, let's go out and sell. I'm going to set a goal for the week. I'm going to try and make X amount of money. And then we can go do that. 
Um, so that's what I would say is the big difference. My friends that are in more hourly, they're really tied to that. Someone else is determining their worth based off of, you know, their hourly pay and, and it's scarce. And it feels that the conversations as I talk to my friends that again, are in more hourly pay, it feels like money is scarce in the door to door industry. Um, I feel like money is, is, is abundant and, and, and it's an abundance mentality. The way that people talk about it, the way that they earn it, um, and, and I'm grateful that I've been able to live in the more abundance because I'm not saying, again, my marriage is perfect. My friendships right. are perfect. But money has been far less of a stressor than, than I thought it would be as a, as a child, you know, when I was noticing that around me. Does that make sense? It absolutely does. Yeah, you're talking my language, brother. So we're going to hang on, hang, hang on here for a little bit. I love it. All right, boys, pitch your tent. We're staying here for the night. All right. So like the psychology of money. One thing that I've, um, I've studied and mastered, um, I, I'm not a, uh, I'm not an expert with yet. Maybe I'm an expert. Maybe I haven't, maybe I'm an expert, but I'm not, I haven't mastered it yet. Mastery, right? Um, I have, I have studied over 10,000 hours of the art of generational wealth and the art of money, like making money and keeping money. So I love the topics around money, which is why I left in theory sales and now focus primarily around helping people with their money. So that idea is, uh, yeah, I, I, I think to just to be clear here for the listeners, like the reason why you probably are not, you, you've maybe hit a ceiling or you have, um, yeah, in theory, you haven't made as much money as you wanted to, or you know, you're at a million, you can't break the million. You're at two million, you can't break the two million. Whatever, you're at a hundred thousand, you can't break the two hundred thousand dollar mark. Um, it's probably because you're finding, as one of my mentors Ed Milet says, is your financial thermostat, and um, you know, you're. It's not a thermometer; it's a thermostat. You know, if you put a fire next to a thermometer, it goes up. Um, in a thermostat, it's, Hey, if, if you cool down, if, if you get too hot, the AC will cool you back down. Um, so it's, it's this idea around what our value is. And again, you're right. I, 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 now I guess this is almost 12 years into this. Um, I have 12 years into like leaving the W2 side, um, friends and, and I think 13 years out of, uh, out of, uh, out of uh, high school that friends now through Facebook and Instagram that either a have been watching me for a long time or are starting to watch me now or like, you know, like they're really, really, really rooting me on now. Um, but I, I know that they definitely, uh, for the most part, not maybe those specific ones, but the people that are not rooting me on, but yet still follow me, um, you know, view my stories, whatever I can see them. Uh, most of the time I don't see them all the time, but you, you I know that they don't think I'm still going to make it. Like they're just waiting on the eventual collapse of Mikey Lucas. Um, which comes down to mindset, which we'll talk about later, which I want to know about how, how that works for you. So yes, the, the, the understanding of I, what I wrote down was um, you, you focus on more internal, you have an internal focus versus a people pleasing focus, because that is how you were able to separate yourself. And you went the opposite route in theory. Um, it, you still took a route. You still got to show up to work. So I, I just, it's, it's confusing Parker. It's just like, confusing when people hear like oh you're in door to door or you're in what you're doing it's like well, yeah i still gotta show up to work every day like yeah. i still gotta do job like yeah it's like do you think i love what i do, do you think i actually love knocking in freezing cold or extreme heat no but i do enjoy it because it's creating uncertainty it's creating ex exploration like i'm 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 making money doing it and if i want to make more money i can make more money and uh you know i just it's just an interesting, it's an interesting conversation to see like the underlying, like why people leave door to door or why people don't get into the door to door, why, what people think about door to door people. Um, not in the sense of like buying from door to door, just like the door to door industry itself. Um, yeah, I, I see, uh, I see there's a lot of similarities that we have here, which I think is really cool. And I'd like to, I wrote a few of them down as you were kind of doing your opening monologue there really enjoying this conversation so far. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that I can get as much of it, uh, much of it for the, the listeners as I can. So is, are you still getting pressure from eight and a half, almost nine years in, almost 10 years into this thing? Are you still getting pressure from your mom, dad, family? 
and what and when did that change how, how are they yeah. are they still kind of giving you like a little pushback here like parker why don't you just kind of slow down a little bit and you know nah, nah, nah. is that great yeah, thing no. giving you guys insurance <laughs> For sure. Um, I'll start with my parents really quick because that was a quick transition. The very first year was actually prior to my my mission. I went out, and when I told my mom I was going to sell, it was kind of like, oh my gosh, like you're an idiot. This is probably you know a scam. It's an MLM or you know whatever. Well, funny enough, I went on my mission, and obviously in the industry we have back end checks. Well, I didn't get my back end because I was on my mission. My mom got my back end, and so she saw like. Wow. And, and interestingly enough, my first year, dude, was tough. I, it was a rough situation. And I, I had, my only goal was to finish. I wanted to be a finisher for once in my life. So I did well. Um, nice. But I, but, uh, I just grinded. I worked really hard. Um, and so funny enough, you know, going home from the mission, I was like, you know what? Like, I don't think I'm going to do this job again. Because I never really felt the, like the money difference that it made, if that makes sense. Because I got it while I was on my mission. Well, I told my mom I wasn't going to sell the next summer. And my mom, like almost in tears, was like, you're an idiot. Like there's no opportunity in the world that can provide you that type of money. Why would you walk away from it when you're doing when you're you're so good at it? Right. So my mom was very quickly on, on, of the understanding of like, OK, this isn't a scam. You did really well. Like you need to take this opportunity because these opportunities don't, you know, come all the time. It's like, if you know, I don't know if you play uh, blackjack ever. But it's like, dude, I was I was dealing, I was dealt an eleven, right? And it's time to double down. Yeah. And so, uh, my mom again. That's quick transition. Um, I do have extended family that I feel like looks from at times to time, from time to time. Like, you know, is he just you know stupid with his money? There's no way he's doing all right. Kind of like you said, it's almost I get this feeling like they're waiting for me to fail, and that's okay, right? Um, because I'm not doing it for them anyway. Like the reason I'm doing it is, you know, there's nothing more important to me than my daughter and my wife. And at the end of the day, like, no matter what you do, there's going to be people that judge you, uh, and that think you're doing it wrong. And, 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 you know, my wife and I, and my daughter were really happy. Uh, we live our, a dream life, a life that we, uh, by design. And, uh, so if people want to have, even if it's family members, friends, if they want to have their, their opinions about it, that's okay. Because again, I'm not, I'm not living this life for them. I'm living it for me and my family. Which is where that internal focus came in from that people pleasing. So why don't you talk about that? Because I think that that is, I don't think it is very clear that that is what's destroying a lot of the young men in our, in our, uh, in our society, in our circles is because we are more focused on the, one of the uh, core values of life, which is significance, which is by, uh, there was a song that I used to play like years ago when I was getting sober uh, by Hunter Hayes called Wanted. And it's like, you want to be wanted. And like, I just wanted to be wanted. I wanted to like want people. I wanted people to like, like Mikey. And sure. I didn't realize that was a destructive road. And until I got my, my head out of my butt, um, did I realize that I'll never please everybody. Like even like uh, there was a quote, I, I forget who said it, but it was, uh, I posted it years ago. It was like a, uh, a memory that came up a couple years ago. And it was like, if you want to please everybody, don't sell, don't be in, uh, don't sell whatever, go sell ice cream. Right. And I was like, okay, so why don't you talk about that for a second? Um, why, what, what, I, I mean, yeah, let's camp there for a little bit. Like what, do you see that that's an issue in a lot of the guys that you're coaching? Like that they, they, they can't get over that. Like, it's not the, it's not the market. It's not the economy. It's not the interest rates. It's not the, whatever it's the, you want people to like, you're people pleasing. Yeah, no, I do. I think it's a huge, in, uh, huge problem, not just within the industry, like you said, but I think within the world, like people are so much more concerned about how everyone else views them. Um, and, and way less concerned about how they view themselves. And, you know, I don't know if you follow football much, but, uh, Deion Sanders, I don't know if you've seen that quote where he says, what about me thinks that I care about your opinion? Like your opinion no. doesn't change my opinion of myself at all. And I think that Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, I think all of those things have created this sense that, you know, in some ways our parents didn't have where it's like, dude, you know, you post a picture and you are determining your worth based off of how many likes you get and how quickly you get them. Right. So, yeah, I think it's a problem. Um, and I think that something that we can all benefit from myself included is just finding like happiness. Like, dude, I, I'm happy with my job. 
And so that's why I think I can weather the storms of people being rude about it, right? Um, I'm really happy in my life. And some people don't think that my life is the way that, you know, I travel a lot. And I know a lot of people see that and think that it's irresponsible. Uh, but again, I work really hard so that I can travel, so that I can experience and I'm happy. So, so if your opinion is that traveling is irresponsible, well, my opinion is that, you know, I'm way happy that I do it. Um, and I think as a generation, you know, as we train at the grit and just in general, like, dude, we want people to start to take the front seat again, because we all do that naturally. We blame everything, but the, the one, the thing that matters, which is you, right? We just, we have a class at the grit that we're teaching. Um, and one of the books that we just read, I actually have it right here, um, is called extreme ownership. I'm sure a lot of people have read it. Uh, but dude, that is like, I think this, the fix, right? You look at, um, Navy SEALs and, and the, the amount of extreme ownership that they take. So I think that's a huge principle, like kind of like the fix to the problem is people just need to take more extreme ownership. And that goes both ways, not just negative. It's like, dude, if you have a really good day in an area, dude, that's your fault. It's because you did it. It wasn't because the hood was good. It wasn't because more people were home. Dude, it's because you created that success. And in the very same vein, dude, if you had a bad day, dude, it's your fault. And funny enough, dude, in my sales career, some of the biggest paradigm shifts I've had is when I actually stop, stopped blaming everything, blaming everyone in every situation and started being like, yeah, dude, I had a bad day because I had a bad mindset today because dude, I was sad. And I'm sure people could feel that. Dude, it wasn't that the area had just been knocked. Because I've knocked plenty of areas that have just been knocked and sold really well. So I know that was kind of a, a lot of different points, but that's kind of my thoughts on on that. Yeah, I think uh, I, I would definitely say that it's it's a lot easier to push blame, and I think that 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 the combination of a few things, but those those two things are larger, and there's like there is a series of things there that um, people pleasing plus shifting blame. It's somebody else's fault rather than it's my fault is is going to destroy many families in the future and i don't um i don't think people are talking about it enough parker um, which is why i have my show and i want to if i want to talk about it i'm going to talk about it because i care about people's marriages which is why i care about helping them not get divorced like my family did because it was around money which is why i was like okay i need to understand this money thing otherwise i'm probably going to get divorced it's about yeah. sex and divorce and i'm like i got the sex thing down we're good there but the, the money thing, I was like, I got to figure that part out. Um, and, uh, and now, now that I know what I know, I, I, I cannot give it back to people, which is why my YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, Facebook, freaking everything has tons of information about what mistakes I made, what I've learned from multiple millionaires that are mentors of mine. And now my billionaire mentor that I have that I, I can't not give it back to people. So, it, but yes, there's the people pleasing side of that Parker as well as the the shifting the blame to somebody else. When I started shifting the blame back to me, it's my fault. I, it, life, did, life did not get better. Life got worse because everyone. I was then the easy target to take everything out on because it was always my fault. And I'm like, well, okay, that's fine. But I had to learn that it wasn't, they were in theory projecting onto me that they didn't want to take the blame for it. So when something didn't go wrong, I would obviously take, because at the end of the day, everything boils down to leadership, right? And, uh, you know, I, I would take ownership of it, but it, it got worse for my life. It didn't get better. It was a lot harder to live knowing that everything was my fault uh, and take responsibility for that. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't easy. Um, do you feel the same way? Yeah. And I, I think it's like, it gets harder, but then it gets easier. Because I would say, as you take, the most liberating thing that can ever happen, I think is really taking extreme ownership because yes it may be your fault and that may be harder but dude you can do something about it yeah. dude if it's the area's fault you can't do anything about it right dude if it's if it's you know uh the house you live in fault that you're or the house that you live in's fault that you and your wife are struggling well then you can't do anything about it right so when you take extreme ownership yes i think it gets harder in some ways but i think what gets easier is you have this power where if it's your fault you can do something about it you can change and that's like a, a core belief of mine is that human beings have the capability to change. Like you are not the way that you are forever if you don't want to be. Dude, if you're not good with money, you can become good with money. If you aren't a good communicator, you can become a good communicator. If you aren't a good salesperson, you can become a, a good salesperson. And that is, 
you know, again, why I think it's such a core belief of mine is I hear a lot of people that put themselves in a box and they say, Hey, I, I can't sell because I'm not X, Y, or Z. And I just fundamentally don't believe that. I believe that you can become anything and that you can change. But in order to do that, you have to take extreme ownership, which gives you the, the ability to change, if that makes sense. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I, I, bro, you're cool, man. We should be friends more. Hey, let's do it. Humans have the ability to change. Yeah. Man, we need more guys like you in this industry. That's awesome. And for our generation in this country. That's, uh, that's really awesome, brother. I love that. Yeah, it's very true. Well, it, yeah, if you don't, if you don't think you can change, then you're screwed. Like it's then that is then everything is actually your fault. And then why would you live at that point? Yeah. Well, and dude, if you think about it, like you know, in the vein of I know a lot of people listening to this podcast or other golden door winners, dude, I feel like we feel stuck so often in life, and I can't I can't think of a feeling that sucks more than feeling like oh I can't do this or I can't become this. But if you really start to look at people, at history, you start to listen to people like Ed Milet and, you know, other, you start to realize that, again, human beings can change. And so if you're listening to this and there's anything about yourself that you don't like or that frustrates you, dude, I'm here to tell you that, that you can change that. And it might not be easy. It might not be fast. But what a, what a cool ability to have as a human being that we can become better and change. And, and, and if you think about it, if we all did this correctly every generation would get better hmm. because I, because you know, I have the ability to learn from my parents and get even better as good as my parents were, I can get better. And then hopefully my daughter, you know, learns from my mistakes and gets better. And, and if you think about it, logically, if we all did this and we believed we could change every generation should get better and better and better. Wow. Yeah. Go back five minutes and re-listen to that guys. That was, that was nugget right there. If you don't think you can change, then yeah, you'll, I mean, I know it sounds cliche, but if you don't think you can change, yeah, you will stay stuck forever. Like you can't lose weight. You can't fix your marriage. You can't get out of financial debt. You can't become a better salesman. You can't become a better father. You can't, well, I become, I come from a lineage of divorce, so I can't change that. It's like, no, yeah. I'm addicted to drugs. Yeah. No, you can change that. The power of will. Well, wow. and Mikey, can I tell you, can I tell you a quick story of like, a, please, to, to put please. it into perspective. So it sounds kind of funny, right? Um, but it, read a book. If, if anyone hasn't read it called how champions think it talks about how we wire our brains and how important our thoughts are. It's my favorite book of all time. Um, but I really learned some principles from this. Um, and one was that again, here's the story. So all growing up, I, I have ADD, right? And so I never really read books. Um, when I got home from my mission, I met with a lot of CEOs and different people to kind of learn what makes successful people tick. And I learned that the majority of people that I wanted to be like read books, but I had programmed my brain for 22 plus years that I'm not a book reader. I had just said that whether it's with my thoughts, like I don't read books. So it's cause I have ADD. Do I can't sit through a book? Um, whatever. And, and what's interesting is that you have to be really careful about the words you speak to yourself. Okay, because our subconscious brain, our subconscious mind takes whatever we say, exactly how we say it. The reason I, I say that is uh, I had put on a, like a vision board, right, that I will be a book reader. I thought I was doing that right. But if you really think about it, what was I saying to my brain for these years? Dude, I am not a book reader right now, but I will yeah, be and one I, day. Someday, one day. And so I'm giving a training about this one day. Um and I start to realize, I have this thought come to me. I'm like, if I really believe that human beings can change, and I believe that, you know, our, our thoughts, like our subconscious brain runs everything, I wonder if I could take this principle and apply it to this, this reading thing. So I look at my goals and I realize first and foremost, my goal was wrong. It's that I need to start telling my mind right now, I am a book reader right now. Now, a couple things to remember. I knew how to read. It's not like I didn't know how to read. I just, every time I would pick up a I book. I just bought it. Yep, Thank you. It's an amazing book. You'll love it. Thank you. Thank you. But I remember as I would pick up a book, it's the conscious part of me that picks up the book and starts to read. But all of a sudden, once I start to get into that flow state, my subconscious mind takes over and goes, dude, Parker, you don't read, man. You're not going to finish this book. What are you doing? So to make a long story short, simple principle, I get a three by five note card and I wrote down, I still remember it. I wrote down uh, two sentences. I am a book reader, period. I love reading books. And I decided it was about a month. I'm going to reprogram my brain. And I carried that three by five note card with me everywhere. And I, every time my mind was blank or if I was stressed or I needed somewhere to go, I would just read it over and over again. I am a book reader. I love reading books. I am a book reader. I love reading books. And the most incredible thing happened. 
Um, about a month later, I get home, you know, I'm in autopilot mode, kick my shoes off. I usually go into the bedroom, uh, watch some TV to decompress after work. And I don't know why, but there was a book uh, that I had bought like four years before sitting on my nightstand. And now because I was reprogramming my brain and my subconscious mind sees a book and because I told myself I'm a book reader, what does my mind do? It goes, let's read a book. So I pick up the book. I sit down, I read 180 pages, which I had never, I'm not kidding you, read 180 pages in one sitting ever. Uh, well, what's interesting is I finished the book in three days and then I bought another book and I finished that book in a week. And then I bought another book and I just kept reading and reading and reading. And what I realized to kind of put this principle we were talking about into, I guess, like an actionable item is, dude, what I had done wrong, it's, dude, I knew how to read, but I programmed my brain to think that I wasn't a reader. So every time I tried to do it, my brain took over and said, no, 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 we're not doing this. What I learned is you can reprogram your brain. Dude, tell yourself you're a reader. Tell yourself you like the gym. Tell yourself you like mornings, whatever it is, and do it often enough. And I don't know how long it will take for everyone because it depends on how hard you've programmed the other thing in. But you can actually reprogram your brain. And in a matter of a month, I went from someone who for 24 years had had a goal to be a reader but could never do it. And in a matter of a month, I all of a sudden became someone who loved books, was pounding through books. And, and, and dude, the only thing I did, I didn't take reading classes. I got a three by five note card and I reprogrammed my brain. Bro. I can attest to that. I'll double down. Number one, I'm from Vegas. So I know blackjack very well. That's right. Um, I didn't read a book until 2015 cover to cover other than like green eggs and hams green eggs and ham i uh, i was in, i was in special classes writing reading um writing and reading or i uh, yeah, reading and writing i was in special classes growing up i was behind where i was like uh, oh okay i guess i can't read then so you're right i had that limiting belief i've read over 800 books now i posted on my instagram the other day i don't know if you saw it or not but i posted how many times i've read some certain books some of them 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 times. It's crazy. And um, I didn't have the same situation, but I did realize I had that epiphany that people that are successful read books, whether that's 50 books a year, 20, bu 20 books a year, two books, a year, whatever. I just knew they read books. And I'm like, I'm at a whole zero in uh, like a lifetime. So I knew that if I was going to catch up, that I, I had to start reading. Um, that was uh, that was profound, bro. Like, I, I think, okay, it, it's like, it's cool because you can start, um, whenever I go on podcasts or get interviewed or, you know, something like that, people go, you know, you, you interview all these top guys. What's the, what's the consistent thing that they have? One of them is, is uh, they, they have read the book Extreme Ownership or Atomic Habits, which I'm sure you've read Atomic Habits. Yep. So already, we're already talking about Extreme Ownership here. Um, and the other one is that they are continually growing um, and, and they're just, they're, they're growing and they're, they're like addicted to personal development. Um, so it's funny. Cause like, brother, like we all have the same 24 hours in a day. Like, what is your excuse? What is your coping mechanism? And you know, I, I suppose it's like, how bad do you really want it? So why? Okay. So let me go back to this. So then, okay. That was the nugget. Appreciate that. Now, help the guys that are on this that maybe they are golden door winner or maybe they're not and and they don't they're not addicted to maybe they haven't seen the the the, the benefit of personal development yet um why is it that they should figure this thing out the self-mastery thing yeah i mean i think there's a lot of reasons i think that uh you'll be a better husband a better mother uh you know a better father a better leader like i i remember john taylor one time saying Dude, you owe it to your people. He was speaking to our leadership group and he said, you owe it to your people to always be learning because if you don't, you will run out of things to give your people, right? And, and so I think that's a, a big reason why you should, right? Is that you owe it to the people around you to just become better. Um, the other thing, right, is uh, there's a reason that if you listen to all these top guys, not even in the door-to-door -door industry, just like the most successful humans in the world, they're all addicted to learning, to reading, to self-mastery, to getting better. And again, I want to, like, those are the people I want to be like. And I would imagine most people listening to this podcast, they also want to be like that. What I would say is like an applicable thing for everyone listening is, dude, sometimes you got to start small. 
right? Like pick one thing. Maybe you just suck at getting up in the mornings and that's something you want to do. Well, dude, work on that one thing. Because I do think a, a, a problem with a lot of people like you and me is we want everything to get better. And so then nothing gets better, right? So pick one thing. Dude, start small. It's okay to, to make these incremental steps, right? Because I had that experience with reading, dude, I was able to transfer that exact same mentality and kind of process onto the doors, into my goal setting, into other areas of my life. But it started with that simple like act of just becoming a reader. So I would say evaluate, you know, what are the things in your life that you know you want to be better at? And dude, maybe don't pick, if there's 10 of them, dude, pick one and work on that one. And that is way more like attainable for me as a human being. Cause dude, when I work on 10, I get better at zero. When I work on one, I get good at like, I get good at that one. And then I move on to number two. And in reality, I will get better at all 10 of those things faster than someone who tries to work on all 10 probably at the same time. So that's what I would say is, uh, you know, it's okay. And, and maybe you can pick one, two or three. My, maybe it's a limiting thing of myself currently is like, dude, I just can't work on a thousand things at once. So. Why do you think lowering the bar of expectation helps? Um, I don't know if it's necessarily lowering the bar of expectation as much as it is, uh, being willing to take the long road, ah. right? You see Tom Brady, right? And to be clear, I'm a big Kansas City Chiefs fan, as you can tell. Um, I hated Tom Brady until he retired. Now I'm his biggest fanboy because I've looked into who he is. Dude, everyone sees Tom Brady and says, dude, I want to be Tom Brady. But you got to remember, dude, Tom Brady wasn't always Tom Brady. I don't even think he started in high school. Dude, mm -hmm. he was like a backup quarterback at Michigan for a while. He got drafted 199th in, in the draft. Basically, on paper, they said, you suck. At the combine, they said, your, your body isn't like fit to play in the NFL. But he worked on things one at a time. He took his opportunities, and he took the long road. Most people would have quit at a lot of those different points. And because he didn't quit and he took the long road, dude, he became Tom Brady. And now who, who hears Tom Brady and thinks 199th in the draft? Nobody, right? So for me, I don't think it's as much about lowering the bar as it is being willing to like, dude, I'm not saying I don't want to work on all 10 things, but I want to work on one thing at a time so I can actually get good at it. So keep your expectations high, but I guess map it out where you can actually get better at everything. And sometimes that's a long road. And I think most people just aren't willing to take that long road. Yeah, the reason why I said lower the bar of expectation is just so that you get you can stack small wins. I was always taught that growing, uh, not sure. growing up, but growing in my personal development career, um, that if you lower the bar of expectation, like, hey, I'm going to get this done and it's going to be done. And I'm going to lose 20 pounds in a week. It's like, brother, you're not in wrestling season anymore. Like, chill. Yeah. <clears throat> so lowering the bar of expectation so that you can say, oh, cool, I'm going to lose one pound this week. Awesome. Well, you lost the pound. It could have just been, you, you know, you know, whatever, didn't drink you know, water the night before and you lost a pound. Okay. Well then it's like, Oh, awesome. Well, I can go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one. Right now I've been on a carnivore for a long time. So I've been losing weight. Uh, ironically, this shirt would have never fit. I actually had to literally have my wife pull it off of me to the point where I was embarrassing. I couldn't wear it anymore. It's, it's a, it's cotton. Got it off like Amazon Chinese kind of stuff. Doesn't stretch. Now nah, it's like Lululemon. I mean, you could like, you know, you could, you could, you could yeah. fake that you're like, you know, in shape. Um, I, uh, it's funny enough that, uh, you say that cause I've been studying, um, Tom Brady for a long time. I, I was in the gym last night after a very long day, 16 appointments I had yesterday, 16 calls, not including my work. And I was like, dude, I don't want to go to the gym. And I'm not like advocating for like, Oh yeah, do the extra mile. Like, I mean, I obviously am, but not, that's not what the point of this is. But yeah. in the gym yesterday, I was in my clothes. Uh, and I was like, okay, if I change and if I go into my bedroom, I'm not coming out. Cause I am that tired right now. And it was a very long day. Um, very good day, but very long day. And I went downstairs and went in the gym. I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I'm going to figure something out. And I, I've pretty much when I'm like at where I think Mikey Lucas's end is, I will throw on Tom Brady. I don't listen. To, I don't as much listen to Ed Milet as much as I used to. in that time frame. I don't listen to Eric Thomas as much as I used to. I definitely don't listen to uh, Jim Rohn at the ends wit. I listen to Tom Brady and yeah. I have been studying Tom Brady for probably the last, like since 2019, I would say, I mean, I've watched some of his videos 
on repeat over and over and over and over because I relate to him because I was cut for my senior year baseball. I was dumped by my high school sweetheart. I like all of that stuff. I had everything against me. And now where I'm at, I'm like, okay, like I'm not even close to where I want to be. But Tom, um, one of the things I want to mention really the point of that was um, Tom talks a lot about the extra work, the extra practices that he went to that I think people are not seeing that, which I had to do because of my learning disabilities. I had to do extra work um, to, to, to catch up even like I wasn't even caught up. Like right now it's, it's the, it's fourth quarter right now. It's, and it's right now it's currently November in 2023. And most people in either business, especially no offense, real estate agents, a lot of guys in solar have slowed down, if not stopped entirely. Um, now, obviously I know in, in, in pest control, mostly it's mostly, I know you guys are changing that, but you're mostly doing summer sales. So it's not necessary for you guys, but it, it is because you can't just take off. You have to continue to grow. But so this is separation season. I learned that from Ed Milet that this is separation season. The fourth quarter, October, November, separate is separation season. And doing that extra work is what can get you ahead the next year. And it might not be the next year or the year after that, that you get ahead, but you have to know that you have to stack those wins one brick at a time. And Tom talks oddly about uh, enough about that, that I think people are missing that he had to put in so much additional work and didn't quit. You're right. He was, he didn't start. He was on uh he was backup quarterback to an O and eight high school team, zero wins, eight losses. Couldn't even get, he was a backup quarterback. Couldn't even get on the field. Right. Yep. And still had to fight for his, uh, he was a red shirt, uh, freshman going into college when in Michigan and, uh, uh, had to fight for his his uh, spot, his fourth year, and then his fifth year, his redshirt year, his final year. Had you know went back and forth with Drew Henson, uh, and uh, basically lost you know not lost a job, but like he was back and forth, back and forth. Like, hey, I'm going to start you in first quarter, start you in the second quarter, and then you're going to we're going to decide who. And it's like, bro, like I've worked so hard for the f four years to get to the spot. Now I'm now I'm the guy, and then you bring in another guy who's a who's a who's a uh, I think it was a freshman or a sophomore at the time drew and now i gotta fight again from the guys below me so you know it just it's just funny to see how people deal with adversity differently and i think the people's expectation parker if i'm correct me if i'm wrong here but their expectation is if it doesn't go my way then it's not good for me like i should i should exit any thoughts around that yeah, I see that in the in, at least in the industry that I'm in so much. You know, guys will have three or four amazing years. And then one year one thing goes wrong and immediately it's like, okay, well, I'm going to go to another company. I'm going to go look for a sign-on bonus somewhere else, something bigger. I feel like you know, that happens a lot. I think, you know, and and not that I'm trying to put a plug in for the grit, but if you want to look at something that is very unique, people look at the grit, they look at the golden doors, they look at the success. Dude, one of the most interesting things that we have is, dude, our senior leadership, the guy, dude, we have been selling together forever. Dude, ben Egan and I did our rookie year together in 2014, right? Like, and we've had lots of like struggles, you know, things happen. And we, and we, instead of saying, hey, this is broken, we, we moved forward. And I think that the reason that the grits culture is, it's not impossible, but I, the reason I believe it's hard to replicate is because you have a large group of people that just never quit, no matter what was thrown at them. And, uh, you, you know, and, and, and we have struggles just like everyone else in the industry, but you see a lot of these top leaders have switched companies three, four, five, six times. Yep. And I think that there is value in, in being planted, right? And being planted in the place, if you're in a culture that's not good, well, then find, take your time to find the culture that is right and then plant there. And I got really lucky. Um, I don't think that I'm really like extra smart. I got really lucky that I, I could see these people. I was like, I know they're going far. I know Benny and John Taylor. I know they're going far and I'm going to hitch my wagon to them. Um, and so again, I get that question a lot. Hey, what's different about the grit? And it's like, well, it's not something that we do this year. It's not just some training that we give. Dude, it's that we've spent years being committed to each other. That no matter what happened, we have this joke that we say, till the casket, like we're, we're ride or die together. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like a lot of people, not just in the industry, but outside of it, dude, when, when the going gets tough, they quit. I think that's why divorce rates are hard. Yeah. Um, or not, not divorce, divorce rates are high, excuse me. Yeah. And my, my favorite uh, poem, which I'm sure you've heard is choose your heart. It's like, dude, divorce is hard. Being married is hard. Choose your heart. Dude, being poor is hard. And I've seen that, right? And being wealthy is hard. Dude, choose your heart. You know, being a good leader is hard 
And being a bad leader is hard. Choose your heart. And, and again, it goes back to that internal locus of control where it's like, I want to just choose my heart. So. Bro. I see why you have 13 Golden Door Award winners in one year on your team. Well, I'll tell you what, it's not one thing I will say is, dude, we work with incredible people. I'd love to take a ton of credit, but dude, these guys, it doesn't matter how good of a leader I am or feel like I am if you don't have people that put in the effort. And one thing that's cool about at least those 13, just to plug for them, dude, I didn't knock one of those doors. I didn't sell one sale for them. They did it themselves. And so I'm glad that I hopefully had some influence. Uh, but man, those guys are special. And, you know, again, you can have an amazing leader, but if you don't put in the work, you don't put in the effort, you don't stand up when you fall down, you don't push through, then it doesn't matter. So again, grateful to be a part of those guys is at least a, a part of their success, but the success is really all their own. All right. Let me ask you this. Respond. However, this, whatever comes out, you are what you tolerate. Yeah, I would say it's not even you are what you tolerate, but um, what you tolerate, you promote. Ooh. So that's what I, that's that, as a leader, that's what I've realized. Like you don't have to necessarily, when you just tolerate it, dude, it, it, you are a promoter of it. And that's not a fun thing as a leader to not tolerate things. I mean, that means you have to have some tough conversations. Sometimes you have to piss people off. Um, a, a really just quick story on that. One of the coolest things that's ever happened to me as a leader um, was I had a rep who was just totally like underperforming. He was being lazy. He was, you know, not working. And, and, and dude, I knew this guy and I knew he was capable of so much more. And for a lot of years as a leader, I would take the easy route of, dude, I don't want to call him. I don't want to piss him off. Like dude, he's probably going through something. And I just, I told my team that year, I said, I'm going to promise you one thing. I commit to be a leader first and a friend second. So when this happened, I realized, dude, like, okay, I got to be a leader. And so I called him and, you know, I was nice about it, but I chewed him out. I was like, dude, you like, you are being, you are living so beneath your potential, dude. You, you have so much more in you to give. And I know that. And dude, like what is sitting in the house? And, and, and I had a tough conversation. Well, fast forward three weeks. Uh, he went from selling zero for four days because he didn't work at all to selling the most he had ever sold. He doubled his summer in three weeks, wow. PR'd every single week. And I got a handwritten letter from that kid thanking me for not tolerating his laziness. And he said to me something to the effect of, dude, I've had so many leaders in my life that just, again, essentially tolerated that type of behavior. A and you were one of the first people that like refused to tolerate it. And I'm so grateful for it. You know, he went on to, to buy like a dream dirt bike that he wasn't going to be able to buy without those three weeks. A and it was at that moment in my leadership that I realized like, most of the people I work with have enough friends. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What they need is a leader. They need, you know, someone to tell them what other people will not. They need someone who is, you know, going to call them out when they're underperforming in a loving way, who is going to support them through their trials. But when they're going through trials, still, you know, help them see that they can get more out of themselves. And, and you know, again, that's easy to say. It's a lot harder to do because I've had a lot more experiences since then where dude, it's tough sometimes to be a leader first and a friend second. Because obviously that dude, I want to be friends with all my guys. But sometimes I got to be willing to piss them off a little bit and kick them in the pants to be able to, you know, get them moving forward. And funny enough, the majority of the time, they're extremely grateful for that. Maybe not initially, but it's the same way with me. Dude, Ben Egan, John Taylor, dude, they've had some tough conversations with me that I did not want to hear. But because they were willing to do that, dude, I became a better man, a better father, a better... Uh, husband. And so I'm extremely grateful that I've had people in my life that were willing to be a leader first and a friend second. Uh, wow. Again. All right. Uh, Parker, you are, uh, you are something else, buddy. That's awesome. Good for you, man. Thank you. I Leaders who tolerate me, me, uh, mediocre behavior are 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 all too common. And I think it promoting. comes down. Yeah, and they promote it, yeah. Leader first, friend second. Um, you know, it's it's ironic, but um, 
I, I had that conversation with my, uh, my mastermind guys today. Cause I was like, Hey, um, I'm going through this. It's a financial mastermind. So it's not like a sales mastermind. So I, I'm like, all right, I'm going through this. This is going to help you guys make more money. Uh, or this is going to help you lose money, whatever. Same thing. Um, I'm going to talk about firing VAs or firing people on your team, sales reps, sales partners, whatever. And I had to go through that whole rigmarole because I'm in the middle of doing that right now. Um, because I've had the tough conversations and it's not working. So um, I've got a partner in my uh, team member, right? Not a partner, but a team member that I have to fire today. And uh, I'm not excited about it. But if I don't do it, that then means that I will then start to tolerate this behavior without the, with the rest of my team. And I already decided that that wasn't going to be who Mikey Lucas was in 2023 moving forward because I had tolerated that in 2022, 2021, 2020, and so on. You get the point. Um, it is not easy to fire somebody. It is not easy to have those conversations. I have, you're right, like I've had all those conversations uh, with this individual and with many times before. But the good thing is, is that I'm having those conversations at month two of within the company, not year two. Because usually I'd be like, ah, oh, it's not a big deal. No worries. Just get it done next time. We'll be okay. Everything is all right. They'll figure it out. They'll figure it out, right? They'll get it. They, they, they got it, right? They come up and you know, these people know how to play the game. And it's unfortunate, but that's what it is. Talk to me. Let's transition. That was dope, by the way. I appreciate you sharing that. That was right freaking dope. Um, why don't you talk to me about your vision board? Uh, talk to me about that. I'm, I'm really big into vision boards. Um, whether that's on my cell phone, my iPad, we got the ones in the closet right here, big on whiteboards. Um, you know, we call, I call it prophesying power or like, you know, uh, um, affirmations, things like that. Why don't you talk about like that a little bit about that? What's, how's that been for you? Why did you do it? What do you know about it? How yeah. do you teach your guys? Um, it's really simple. Right. I, I explain it like this. Um, if you get into a car and you don't put anything into the GPS and you don't have a direction that you're heading, you'll end up anywhere and you'll probably be can't, you can't be happy or sad because you, you didn't have a destination you were trying to go anyway. The reason I use that analogy is if you put something into the GPS and you make a wrong turn, what happens? It immediately recalculates and gets you to the same, you know, the, the, the destination that you want. Um, and so I think a lot of the success that I attribute in my own life is because, you know, I was around good people that pushed me to create a vision, right? Um, the biggest I could possibly dream when I was a little kid was to have a boat. Um, I had an aunt who had a boat and my family, I come from a divorced family like you. Um, all my siblings were very different, didn't have a lot of common you know, hobbies or interests. But boating was like a sacred thing, right? Because we all like to do it. But unfortunately, right, we didn't have a boat. So I had to wait to get invited to go on this boat and have these, you know, sacred experiences. And, and thank goodness my aunt invited, you know, our family a ton. But as a little kid, I, I still have a clipping of it. Um, I often send it to you sometime. I was in like kindergarten and said, what do you want to be when you grow up? Most people say, you know, a, uh, a astronaut or a fireman or whatever. And I said, I want to be a boat owner. <laughs> and uh, so the reason that I, one of the big reasons I got into or stayed in sales after my first year is I was like, you know, I don't want to wait till I'm 40 to own a boat because a huge dream of mine has always been to invite people on my boat, to give people that didn't have the, that have to wait to be invited, give them the opportunity to come with me because I know what it's like to have to wait to be invited. Right. So my second year I created a vision and I said, through this job, I'm going to buy a boat. Um, I said it over and over and over again. And my third, I think it was my third year, I set a goal. I said, Parker, we're going to do a little carrot at the end. of it. This is just talk to myself. I said, if you sell 600 accounts this year, you're going to buy a boat. And then I said it every day to myself. I still got a three by five note card. I said, I'm a boat owner. I sold three or 600 accounts. And, and interestingly enough, I sold 600 accounts that year. And I'll never forget going to the bank with my mom, uh, buying my first boat. It was an older ski boat, but it was a boat and watching my mom like cry, seeing me, you know, accomplish again, the biggest I could dream as a little kid was that. And I accomplished it at 23. Um, funny enough, that's how I met my wife was through that boat. Um, I've now sold that boat. I now have another dream boat. Um, and, you know, this summer I was able to take like over 50 different people on my boat. And, and I love it, dude. I love looking at them and seeing them smile and even some people that don't like boating, I have a friend whose wife isn't even like a boater, doesn't even like boating, never gets in the water, but she's like, it's so good for my mental health. I just love being on the boat. So uh, vision boards is the reason I'm in this job, right? And obviously I've graduated from, you know, 
okay, I only want a boat and I've created, you know, more, I don't know if you can see this, but this is, you know, my current vision board. Um, but I believe that you, I believe that just as human beings can change, human beings can accomplish great things, can accomplish anything, but they have to know what they want. Um, a really big, the, the reason I made this specific vision board was Jimmy Rex. He came and spoke to us at the grit and he said, you need to be really careful about what you put on your vision board. Cause you'll probably get it. Be very specific. Take a lot of time because like the things that you put on there matter. And this is the craziest story. So I put three and a half years ago, went on Google and I typed in KTM dirt bike, picked a random dirt bike, which I wasn't apparently listening to uh, uh, Jimmy's advice. Random dirt bike looks cool. Put it on there. A year later, I bought the exact dirt bike, same year, same model. And I had no idea. I got home, was looking at the bike, looked at my vision board and I was like, Dude, that's the same. And you can tell because they change the graphics year to year that it's it's literally the exact same bike. And that just, you know, taught me the principle that Jimmy was saying is like, dude, don't just put any, make sure it's the picture of the truck you actually want. Make sure it's the house that you, the style that you really want. And so anyone that works with me at The Grit, that's the first thing I'm going to tell them is like, what do you want? Dude, if you don't have a goal with the summer, you'll probably get nothing, right? Or you'll be happy with anything. And I tell them this, you know, I, I, I challenge everyone to create a vision board. I'll help them do it. Uh, you know, if you want to create a vision board, don't know how, DM me on Instagram, underscore Swandy. It's a nickname, S-W-A-N-D-Y. Because I believe that if we all had, if we could all raise our vision of what we want, dude, we would accomplish great things. And, and to, to be clear, I want to give a little bit of a, you know, I want to speak from the heart about vision boards. Not everything on your vision board needs to be this like sentimental, life-changing. Yes, there are those things. Dude, some, some things on my vision board are kind of vain. Dude, I want a supercar, right? Dude, some things are, I want a helicopter. That's something I just added to my, to my vision board. I, I hear people that bring these vision boards and it's almost like they're putting what they think I want them to put on there. Oh, dude, I want to be an amazing leader. And that's great. And I think you should do that. And you should have some of those things on your vision board that are like, you know, important to you, important to the world, life-changing. But also, dude, it's okay to put some stuff on there that's a little bit selfish, some stuff that's exciting. Like, dude, I get out of bed every day. And when I see a helicopter, I am so far from that. So far from that. But it motivates me to be like, well, dude, the only way we're going to get there is if we get out of bed and start working. So vision boards, I believe in them. Um, I've seen the power in them. Uh, I think they need to be everywhere. Have it on your back on your phone, your computer, you know, see it often. Put that into your subconscious mind and start to see it in the present tense. Not like I'm going to get this dirt bike. It's like, oh, dude, I already have that dirt bike. I already have that house. And uh, like Jimmy Rex said, be really careful what you put on there because you'll probably get exactly what you put on there. That's so cool. Never did I ever think that I would get the things that were on my vision board or in my, uh, my goal notebook that I would write down every day. Like never. <clears throat> I was like, this is not real. This is not true. But it is very interesting how the power of what you, your reticular activating system, um, when you start to see, you know, that red Tesla that you dreamed about and, or that white Tesla you dreamed about, you know, it, it's now yours. Um, that's really cool. What, um, what are, give me some other things that are on your, on your vision board. I want to, I want to know. Yeah. Um, now. so I have a big lake house, um, as you can see right there on the bottom, I want a house that, you know, my boat has its own garage in the water. Um, and I will have that. I already believe I have it. It's, it's a place, it's going to be a summer home where my daughter, my future kids, my friends are going to come and it's going to be a place where we decompress. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have a houseboat on there. I'm working on getting one of those this year. Uh, not quite that model. Uh, that one's a little still maybe, you know, in the future, I have horses on there. I want a ranch. Um, I love being in nature with my daughter. She loves being outside. Uh, we try to have her watch as little TV as possible because, dude, we want her to enjoy God's creations, the earth, and she loves it. And so I want to have a, a place that is like, dude, it's our, our family's ranch. We have horses and cows and fields and pastures. And, and, and it sounds kind of funny, but I want to I want to have a little cowboy life where, dude, my daughter, my, my future kids, we can go to this ranch and just do whatever we want, right? It's, it's our own law out there needs to be big enough that it can be our own law out there. Right. Um, I have, it's funny. I just knocked off one of these last week. I did, totally forgot. Um, I went to Bora Bora last year or la last week. I don't know if you can see it right there. Yep. Um, but yeah, I just knocked that one off. I have a, That's I want cool. a 19, 
1979 Trans Am Macho. It's a, a muscle car that I love. Um, I want to have a house in Arizona. I have Grant Cardone on there because uh, I, I I want to. Grant Cardone's funny. I really like him. He's he's a salesman through and through, but he has influenced my life in a huge way. And so the reason I have him specifically on there is I want to, you know, develop myself enough that one day I can influence people the way that he's influenced me. Uh, yeah. And then I'm trying to think of other things on there. Let's see. Uh, and then, yeah, I have, uh, I want to go to, the, I want to see the chiefs win a super bowl. It's kind of tough last year. They won the super bowl on my birthday and I didn't go. So oh. on my part, but, uh, yeah. And then, and then I have a bunch of other little stuff, you know, an, an RV, razor stuff like that and he- again the helicopter is the big one um i met a guy uh named ryan who took me up in his helicopter and we chatted a ton about his story and his life muscle and, yeah not not the muscle but his partner uh yeah. his partner ryan um and dude like i'm gonna own a helicopter and i can't wait to do it my favorite place in the world is lake Powell. uh i'd go there over any country in the entire world and ryan gave me the like celestial experience of flying in a helicopter over my favorite place and that's when i realized like dude i i gotta do this so th- those are a couple things on mine that's awesome i love that cool yeah i mean i, I think i think i would uh definitely get dms or comments and like what's on his vision board uh, i think people need to expand their their mind and because you're right you know he who says he can and he who says he can't are both usually right well and with that mikey what i would say is it should be a live thing, right? Dude, at yeah. some point, the things on there scares me. Most of them scare yeah, yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. A lot of them have stopped scaring me. And so I add new things. And and this is the example. I, so if you're creating a vision board, you haven't done one. Here's what I would tell you. Dude, the Wright brothers. Back when there was no cars, nothing like that, had the idea. Hey, I want to put men into or men and women into the air to fly. Everyone in the world would have told them they're crazy. Could not happen. But because they had a vision... Dude, look at what we have in the world because of them. And so like as a society, we need to be people that have vision. And remember, it doesn't need to be realistic and it should scare you. Otherwise, it's not a dream. If you're already the person, you're already capable of accomplishing that, then I don't think that's a dream. That's a reality. Dude, put things on your vision board that make you become a better person, that scare the hell out of you, that make you wake up and go, oh, dude, I I can't hit a helicopter. So I got to go become a person that can do that. So again. Remember the Wright brothers? I think they're they're my favorite people to think about when I think about my dreams, to think about what the world has become because of people that are unrealistic, that have a dream that is unrealistic. And uh, and then as you create a vision board, dude, it, it's fun. Dude, it should be exciting. It should be a little bit scary. And uh, and as your vision board, as you start to knock those things off, keep adding to it and creating new things that make that that force you to become the person that can that can accomplish that. What are your biggest weaknesses? I'm extremely emotional. Um, and for a long time, I thought that was a bad thing. And that's something I'm working on accepting is that dude, it's okay to be emotional. It's what, it's what makes me, me. Mm-hmm. Um, I, because, you know, I love people. Uh, sometimes you can, I can overlook things. If that makes sense. I can tolerate things. If that, ma- uh, I would say another big weakness of mine is, is just, uh, be, and I don't think ADD is a bad thing to be clear. I love that I have ADD, uh, but I, I'm always excited about a ton of things. And so something that I, you know, a, a big reason that Skyler is like the best business partner in the entire world is he focuses me on one thing at a time. I can have a hundred ideas, but he's like, okay, let's work on this one thing. Um, and that can be a real weakness. I think that I need a business partner like Skyler because without it, dude, I think I would have a hard time accomplishing anything because I'm just trying to do everything. And then I, I would just say, sometimes I think I care too much um, about a lot of things, right? I take things really personal. I, I, I can. But again, I don't think that weaknesses are necessarily a bad thing. Uh, I've recently started going to therapy and I'm, I love it. Dude, it's taught me that, you know, therapy, I think, has a really negative uh, connotation. Dude, what therapy is for me, and I'm not saying anyone should or shouldn't, but dude, it's just taught me that, dude, I am the way that I am because of things that have happened. And that's not, and it helps me accept it. And dude, I love learning more about myself. And, uh, and so I think that's been a really big weakness up to this point in my life that I'm starting to work on is like, dude, I didn't really know why I was the way I was. I just kind of took it like, yeah, I am this way. 
um, it's been really liberating to understand how my childhood, how my parents divorce, how my upbringing, how that has really like influenced and, and helped kind of shape and mold me into who I am. And for me, therapy isn't about necessarily changing my like horrible self. Dude, it's about understanding and loving myself. Yeah. So those are some weaknesses. I'm sure, I'm sure I have a lot more that my, my guys could tell you about. Um, but those are the ones that come to mind. I appreciate that. Let me try to land the plane here. Um, this has been really fun. I expected this, but I am blown away. Uh, I was told people uh, that uh, at the grit that I said, once I found out who John Taylor was, um, I almost wish I would have not got into solar and would have followed him. But I, uh, I needed to, and I'm nowhere, nowhere am I saying that I am near that where he's at, but I needed to become the John Taylor in my industry. And, um, again, I don't have 50,000 golden door award winners, but I knew that I, I knew that I needed to occupy my streets. Um, but dude, I am not surprised that John has a guy like you and Skyler under him and the guys that you mentor and coach. I'm, I'm, I'm not blown away. I'm just like, Oh yeah, this is, uh, to be expected because right. these guys are the way that they are, uh, you know, uh, which is cool because I, I, I want to, I'm, I'm getting to know more about the grit. Um, obviously cause the show I interview golden door award winners and only golden door award winners. So you guys got a bunch of them. So I'm, I made a joke, I think with Alec the other day, I was like, uh, I'm going to probably like, just do like a general, like group podcast with all of y'all at one point, you know, to like, you know, whatever. So, but, uh, no, this individual stuff is, uh, is a lot better. Um, I am, uh, yeah, I am, I'm impressed, but I'm, I'm, it was kind of, it's kind of expected, uh, being a senior partner at the grid. Like I, I expect this level of, um, competency in you and, uh, I see why you're that way. And I, I appreciate it because it's, um. Uh, it's good. Let me ask yeah. you this. Um, yeah, of course, brother. Um, what are some of the, what are some of the other books that you, uh, highly recommend? I, I have extreme ownership. I have, uh, how champions think, what are some other books that you recommend? Yeah. Um, if you're, or that have changed your life. Yeah. Um, if you're in the door to door space, door to door millionaire, um, it, it's a little bit outdated, but, I, but I would say the principles hold true. I recommend everyone. I don't care if you're in solar alarms, pest control. Like I think the principles are sound. Um, let me think. Let me look at my books back here. You know, a really interesting book uh, that has changed my life. I, I'm a very religious person, um, but there's a book called The Genius of Jesus. It's not a religious book, interestingly enough. It was one that Jimmy Rex recommended. It's It, it takes uh, Jesus, like let's say he's not a uh, like a god, but like what, what about his human actions did he do? And what can we learn from that? Because a lot of people discount his life and say, oh, well, it's just because he was a god or, you know, whatever. But the book takes, a, I've never read a book like it where it says, let's just say, okay, let's say he's not those things. Let's just look at the things he did as a human, the way that he treated people, the way that he interacted people and what we learn from that. It was really eye opening. Um, and then uh, the 5 a.m. club I love uh, by Robin Sharma. Um, I did 75 hard last year. So I was pounding through a lot of books and it's, it's a really interesting read because it reads like a story, not so much like a self-help book. Uh, but it just sold me on why like mornings are so important. Uh, let me see if there's any others that I just love. Um, I'm just looking at my bookcase here. Uh, the Go Giver is really, really good. And then Think and Grow Rich um, are, are all books that I love. Again, my, my number one book is How Champions Think because I think that the most powerful tool that we have is our mind. And dude, we invest money in real estate and we invest money in crypto and all these things. But I think where we should invest so much of our time and money is into our mind. And that book is what kind of sold me on the power of the, the mind. Uh, that, that's one of the, the books that gave me that foundational belief of humans can change and can become whatever they want. So uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing some of my favorite books because, you know, on the spot, that was like, thinking of thinking okay. grow rich, right? Yeah. Huh. And, uh, yeah, I think those are, those are the ones that I've just, cool. yeah, you're with. probably thinking of like 17 after the call. You're like, dang it. Watch. Let me get back on. Yeah. Mikey, we have to do that all over again. How many times <laughs> I've had, I've had that. I've had it happen like a couple of times where I'm like, Mikey, that podcast sucked. I got to do it again. I'm like, bro, you did an amazing chill. We can run another show if you want, but that was amazing. I am not, not posting that. That was fire. Shush. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, what are some other, uh, what are some other, um, core beliefs as you call them? I call them quotes that I live by. Um, what are some other core beliefs or quotes you live by that you, maybe you tell yourself over and over again, like what are some of those? Is there, is there any themes? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, a huge one is the way you do anything is the way you do everything. Um, and I tell people this with sales, people call it a summer sales job, but I'm like, dude, if you half-ass a summer sales job, you'll probably half-ass another job, right? Dude, if you're lazy at this job, you'll, I'm not saying you will be, but dude, you'll probably be lazy in your marriage, right? I believe that like, actually the way you do anything is the way you do everything. If you treat people kindly it, at a restaurant, you'll probably treat other people kindly. So I just believe that. Um, one that my dad, my dad's a plumber. Um, and I was, uh, the king of half doing jobs when I was, when I was in you know, junior high, high school. And I remember my dad saying something, a job worth doing is a job worth doing right the first time. And he would say that often because as a plumber, he, he live his business is built around fixing people's half-ass jobs, right? Like yeah. people doing things not right the first time. And, and I really learned a lot watching my dad, watching the way that he, uh, operates and how he really takes his time to do things right the first time, regardless of the cost. But if he has to restart, if he has to spend some of his own money, he just did things right. Um, and then I love the quote, like who you are is not who you will be or, or who you are is not who you will become. And that gives me that hope that like, dude, I'm not stuck. I'm not stuck the way that I am forever. Um, and then I, I think there's a quote, um, that's a, I, I'm probably going to butcher the quote. But the, the, the sentiment of it like just rings so true in my mind is like, there will be no success in the entire world that, we're, that will overcome a failure in the home. Oh. And, and it, I, I'm probably misquoting, I'll send it to you later, but it, basically the, the sentiment of it is like, dude, I don't care how much money you make, how much influence, how much power you have. Like, dude, if you're a shitty dad or, or a bad husband, dude, it's like, None of those accomplishments will overcome that. So to me, the most important thing in, in the entire world is my family, is my wife, um, is my daughter. And dude, I want to be wildly successful. I want to make a lot of money. But at the end of the day, I refuse to do that at the expense of my relationship with my daughter. Right? Not I at refuse. the cost of your family. Yeah. So again, no accomplishment outside of the home will ever overcome or will ever supersede a failure within the home. So, so it's again, something to that effect. And I, I think that runs a lot of the way that I operate. So let me touch on that for just a second. Yeah. Our parents and maybe even their parents generation was really big at, you know, the whole American dream. Our generation who has like a freaking probably 80% of our parents have been divorced um are starting to realize that, which I'm glad there's a great awakening with that that I've had to explain that to my wife many times, Parker, like, sweetheart, I don't think you understand. I don't think you get it. Like, though I'm driven, though I'm, I got grit, I've got ambition, and I've got all these goals and dreams, and we've got the vision board, we've got all that, but I'll be the same as a theater teacher. Like, I don't need all that stuff. If that's going to ruin our relationship in 20 years, I could care less. Yeah. Like, I'm going to be the same exact person as somebody that's getting paid $40,000 as a, PE teacher, like I'll, I'll go be a weightlifting teacher. Yeah. If that's what means it's going to save my marriage, brother, like I don't need to be a billionaire that bad. If it's going to destroy yeah. my marriage, oh my gosh, what in the world? But that is not, it's not really her fault, but I've had, I've actually struggled with that to like explain that, uh, like really articulate, not just explain, but like articulate where I really, really mean that. Like I, I don't, I don't want to have what our whole entire parents generations had like whether they were divorced or just unhappy living together that is not what i yeah. want well dude and, and with that i think again since a lot of people listening to this i think we're all similar right we're very driven we, we want big things dude i think we can all you know it would be a service for all of us to to, to make sure our spouses know that right like because you know same thing with my i've tried to explain that like dude like babe if, if it ever gets so bad or, or like you are the most important thing to me, not money, not success. Like if you, if, if to be happy, same thing, I got to quit and got to go be a PE teacher. Like that's the most important thing. And I think because all of us are so successful, I would imagine being married to us at times is hard because it would be very easy to forget that because we're so driven. We work so hard. We do so many things 
you know, sometimes I, I would imagine most of our spouses think that like, is the most important thing to him success or is it me? And I think we can all level up by, by, you know, making sure we have that conversation, not once, but often, you know, that like our spouses, our kids, they're the most important thing. Um, and then I thought of one more quote that, that, I, that I just, you know, I, I love to live by is who are you when no one's watching? I love that quote because we all like act a certain type of way, whether we want to or not, when people are watching. And to plug John Taylor, Garth, John, Josh, those guys, the reason I am a, I am a, I am a servant of theirs for life is because I've seen time and time again what they do when no one's watching. The way that they treat people when they do not have to treat them that way. When someone is leaving the company, totally screwing them and they don't need to pay them the, the, the bonus that they, whatever, and they do it. They do what's right, not what's easy. And, and I believe that most of the time it's when no one's watching. And so that is another quote that I love is who are you when no one's watching? And that's, dude, if I can be the same person, the same Parker, or if you can be the same Mikey when no one's watching that you are when everyone's watching, then that's, I mean, that to me is a, is a huge goal in my life is to be the same person when no one's watching. Yeah, because I think that we always know somebody is watching. God is always watching us. Yep. Bro, this was this was a pleasure, bro. I had tons of fun. Bro, I've got almost three pages worth of notes. Like, I love it. You're the first person that's that's given me like five quotes, six quotes, like that. I mean, I could probably well, tell you, you about about the same. I've, I there's like you you and not not, not like throwing shade, but like. I can tell you have it because you, you're like, yep, this one, then this one. Like I can tell you beat it into your head. Like you've had to work on that. It didn't come naturally to you. You had to reprogram your mind. You didn't have a choice. You had to, and you did. You turned your shoulds into a must and you did. Well done, Thank brother. You. You're just getting yeah, started. I had tons of fun. Yeah. And you're just getting started. So uh, don't, don't, uh, don't get off the gas. Keep going forward. Well done. Um, any uh, any final words for the Golden Door Award winners? Yeah, I would just say, uh, you know, uh, I, I think as Golden Doors in, in the industries that we're in, whether that's, again, alarm, solar pest, meats, whatever, it can be so competitive that we become each other's enemies uh. or we create this wall. And I think that something that I've really realized as I've gotten older is, dude, we, we can be we don't even have to work at the same company, dude. Like we can be a support system for each other. We can, dude, I, I would love to make friends in the industry, right? I would love if you're a golden door winner or, or not a golden door winner listening to this and you're not at my company and you don't want to come to the company I'm at, dude, let's talk. Let's create a community of successful people, of, of like-minded driven people. And I think that unfortunately, because of the competitive nature of our industries, it feels like that's a no-no, right? Like that's a, dude, you do not cross that line. But I would say, right, like, I think we can all, all of our companies, all of our industries will benefit from us blurring that line and becoming friends and, and learning from each other and, you know, going against the grain and saying, Hey, yeah, we might work at different companies, but dude, let's like, let's be friends. Let's learn from each other. And, uh, I would love to be a part of that. Right. And, and, and again, this is not me trying to like backhandedly recruit someone. This is me saying like, I could genuinely benefit from some people that again, don't ever want to work with me, but want to learn from each other. Love that brother. Appreciate it, man. It's been a pleasure. Happy Thanksgiving. Merry Christmas. We'll see you at Dorcon. All right, brother.